Welcome to the Military Transition Academy's PM Pathfinder Series, where Max Rogers, former enlisted Marine turned naval officer and civilian energy industry project manager extraordinaire, teams up with the formal Navy enlisted and Army officer candidate Eric Doc Wright, Vesta PM's founder and best selling author, alongside Jeremy Burdick, a retired Air Force chief, aircraft mechanic, and aviator turned civilian operations chief and process specialist for Vesta PM and the PDU University, bring you an audio video suite to help you find the path while mentoring you in the profession of project management. Along the way, you can study for your CAPM, PMP, PMIACP, Scrum Master certifications, or just maintain your professional development units in a casual, enjoyable conversation between All friends. Right. Welcome back to another episode of the PM Pathfinder. And today we've got Garrick, our lead instructor for Vesta PM. And I'm excited for this one because we're going to go over some real tangible stuff. It's somewhat hard, I think, or difficult to verbalize some of the 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 techniques or some of the visual processes that critical path for example requires or scheduled variants would would display uh, but we're going to do our best to do it and then explaining the work breakdown structure i think we can talk through that one pretty easy but let's start with the critical path and this is where you know pmi really talks about um it having the it's basically the longest sequence of dependent activities right through start to completion and i know that's kind of hard to like visualize but essentially you know what are all these tasks on a on a timeline that have to be done and there's no wiggle room that would be like a critical path um so garrick let's just start with quickly how do you kind of how do you explain this in class one um and then two maybe a, a quick example of critical path method yeah. Um, I was going to joke and just say, I don't, I just skip it. And no, uh, <laughs> usually, so usually we cover schedule after we've covered scope, which I think is a pretty natural progression out in actual project land. Um, but by this point we've decomposed or broken the work down to uh, smaller increments. And so the smallest increments activities for a predictive project are what we're trying to schedule out. Um, and critical path, like you said, represents the longest uh, network path from start to finish in a project, which I like to describe as <clears throat> a uh, the long pole in a tent. If you're trying to put a tent up and, you know, old cadet Dennis back in the day did not know how to do that and no one else did either. Um, so I give this imagery of a very long pole with a tent shrouding it, and you've got a bunch of cadets guarding this one pole because it's the only thing between us and rain. And then a bunch of short poles that are leaning up against the tent maybe, but not really uh, impacting it. And so I give the reference that that long pole is the critical path and the tent itself is the project completion date, which is really important because by this point in a project, we've set that expectation and that precedent usually with stakeholders to some degree. Uh, we're still planning, but we're probably giving initial estimates at this point to someone. So it's important because just like cadets in the rain, if we shift that long pole, the entire tent moves with it. And so if that critical path is extended in any way, the estimated project completion date shifts with it to that same degree. And so what do you do with the tent? Because we are not going to magically know how to set the, ted, the tent up at two in the morning in the rain. We just hyper guard this long pole and, you know, people bump into it and we, we tell no one to move and, and we put guards around this long pole. Um, and in the same way on a project, the critical path becomes that sequence of activities that you have to basically do extra uh, guarding against. And this would probably be in terms of conducting additional risk analysis for these activities. A simple example is if you have an activity that is uh, digging the foundation for a home that we're building, then maybe you might go to the length of hiring an, a whole separate crew that physically shows up and that'll cost you time and money to hire them and have them show up. But that way, if the first crew doesn't arrive on time or doesn't arrive at all, or the company cancels, whatever happens, you have this additional crew uh, on standby. And that way, that activity of 
say digging the foundation of our house won't get messed with because you've planned additional you know resources in a sense so you can kind of get creative and see how you would need to plan against the guarding of the critical path but i think that's a pretty good visualization that help people realize uh what the critical path is and and you know why we care if it gets messed with um, because that's essentially our project completion date that they are all exactly linked to and so any shift in the critical path shifts the project completion date um i like that well like yeah that. And i think i think ultimately you know just to back up a little bit for anybody listening is the the idea of any slip in any one of the tasks on that critical path will then push the completion date to the right right so if, if we delayed that foundation by 14 days because of rain or whatever else if we didn't have that in our schedule with some sort of delay that it, then we are delayed the project delivery date gets delayed and now the customer gets upset because they said they could move into their house on 1 January. Well, now it's going to be 14 January because we didn't plan for any kind of weather delay in that first activity or that critical activity. Right. Yeah. And it's uh, another visualization, I think, that that goes with that is dominoes. So even if an activity here is linked to you know 10 other activities, you might think, oh, no, surely there's somewhere in here. Well, the critical path in planning, and again, a predictive environment, this is very important that we have a lockstep, regimented, tight, tightly wound plan. Uh, and so accordingly, you, you don't have wiggle room according to the plan on the critical path. If one activity uh, lags, let's say 14 days, it's a domino effect. It'll immediately bump into the next activity, bump, 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 and it starts this chain reaction that we know automatically will, you know, again, move that project completion date. So, um, yeah. And it's not to say that there's not non-critical activities. So like even in the domino thing, I like, I like that visualization because I think you can picture it. Every kid's knocked over dominoes and sometimes you have, you know, three or four different paths. Well, right. the only path that really matters is that central path that's knocking over those other secondary paths because yeah. the secondary ones can come back into the first and everything else. And they're not necessarily, if they get delayed a little bit, it doesn't affect the estimated completion date of the project per se. It just affects when those kick off. Uh, it's not to mean that they're less important from a stance of, hey, you should probably be on time on budget on scope. It just means that the delivery date for the schedule is going to get affected, which then affects customer satisfaction, which affects stakeholder satisfaction, which affects you maybe not having a job next time. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And so there's different ways to mitigate that, of course, but in the in the easiest kind of initial sense, it's managing expectation uh, to maybe not give initial estimates, even though people are asking you for them while you're still conducting this planning. Um, and it may be to add just a big buffer onto the end of your project that you then uh, that you then manage. But I like uh, the third and final visualization. I was searching for his name in my head, but uh, Dr. Eli Goldrot is who that theory is based on. It's the critical path is built on the theory of constraints, which is essentially um, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And so it's that same with the domino example that we only kind of care about this main stream of dominoes falling when there's little offshoots like that looks cool too. But if that main one doesn't go, uh, that's like the whole point of the, the domino sequence there. Um, so in the same way, all of the network paths from start to finish in a project that are not on the critical path, it's important to know we'll have some amount of what we call float, which essentially means that those activities will not affect or at least do not directly affect the project completion date so in building a house let's say there's a um we'll call it a secondary path uh, something not critical is um installing the hvac and some of the interior design or something and i'm just making that up but we're saying if those activities get delayed a week or two or days or whatever it might be it's not necessarily going to affect us getting this house to the customer in fact they might even be able to start doing initial inspections or something while some of this finishing work is uh completed so 
obviously I'm just making that example up, but there's a lot yeah. of activities. Yeah, that- it's good. It's, we- it's good because you think about the HVAC, although critical to delivery of the project, can slip to the right or to the left, hmm. um, you know, in this, in the sense of, Hey, got a foundation. We definitely have to frame it. We definitely have to have a roof before we can start bringing in drywall. We definitely have to have electricity before we put the drywall up. So, I mean, but the HVAC can be done anytime after the roofing drywall is done right. or whatever else. So, I mean, there's probably a critical task that triggers the HVAC and it has to sit in a window, it doesn't necessarily affect the completion date. So uh, I think that's a really, that's another good example. Yeah. One way like a project manager might put this on paper is through a network diagram or a, a PND or a schedule network diagram. There's a lot of different names, but essentially it's nodes on a paper. Yep. And it's, and it's think about it like step A, step B, step C, or step one, step two, step three, however you identify the tasks you're going to put this on paper and then you're going to, uh, and I like that you brought up float, right? And you're going to put in, you're going to identify the float between each of those tasks. How much float would you ever find on a critical path? Yeah, exactly zero. <laughs> zero, right? It's always zero. <laughs> There's zero float on a critical path. So, I mean, that's a great test question that PMI likes to ask, yep. you know, or at least lead you down um, the wrong path on. Uh, there's always zero float on a critical path. So yes, yeah. And and again, that points out which which people might see on the vignette style questions where they just give you a huge, you know, paragraph to di- digest, is that if it's not on a critical path, an activity or an entire sequence of activities, a network path, uh, that means you can basically have a window of execution. Um, but yeah, that critical path will have zero float, and that simply represents that it can move zero whatever days, hours, weeks, however you're measuring your project uh, schedule, it can move zero of those increments without affecting the estimated completion date. So again, it's like, however, however you look at it, that critical path ends up representing the most sensitive path of activities, which you can then kind of easily plan against, you know, mitigate the risk, plan against the risk of those things being delayed or canceling or anything like that. Yeah, I like that. I think that's that's an important thing to point out, especially when you're talking about you know risk planning. You know, the the most risk planning probably should be around your critical activities if you've got those identified. So, yeah. um, identify those activities, estimate those durations, get it on paper, figure out what your longest path to completion is, and that'll give you your critical path. And then you can you know you can do a couple of forward pat backward passes through your schedule network diagram and it's hard to talk about but we can find you know you'll find videos or whatever else for that just look that up um and and essentially you'll you'll determine that there's zero float on the critical path but there's going to be float typically on some of the alternate paths right Um, and then manage your project right when you're managing that project eyeball should be on that critical path almost every day like is this a critical activity I've got to manage that. I've got to make sure that it doesn't slip. If it does, it's an immediate uh, impact to my delivery date. Yeah. And I, I get really good questions sometimes, you know, naturally any instructing, you get, you get the whiz bang question that that throws you off. And one I commonly get on this subject is, well, hypothetically, if something does then change and we do have to go to the stakeholder or the customer or the sponsor to some degree and say, Hey, we need, you know, I need more time or, Hey, I have bad news. We're going to be later but that's the nature of the world um, for this project. Hypothetically, does a critical path ever change? And so, yeah, what you have to reanalyze what your critical path or even paths are throughout the project. So it's important to know that it's almost an adaptive idea to hit the refresh button regularly on a project, but you need to do that in a predictive project as well. Um, there's no such thing as building your schedule and then kind of closing your eyes while it gets executed, you know, hoping, hoping for the best. Um, so yeah, you reanalyze your critical path. You watch it very carefully. Um, and when this stuff all kind of culminates in putting activities with durations on an actual calendar, it's much easier to see because <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. You're either on your schedule, which is not likely, uh, or you're behind it or you're, you know, you're ahead of it. So this analysis helps you see how far off the the critical path or how far off your schedule you are 
uh, but particularly what activities you can guard to prevent that. So it's a lot of preventive action is how I look at critical path analysis. Yeah, I like it. I like that you even brought up the schedule part because that's really our next topic is calculating scheduled variance. Mm. Uh, before we leave, and obviously um, it applies to both, if you do get off, it doesn't mean you're permanently off either. Like everything changes, everything's dynamic. And you can use techniques like fast tracking where you bring on, you know, two HVAC experts or multiple framers, if, if that's the critical task, or you see a task down the line, can I make it up? You know, you always want to try to make it up as early as possible, uh, expend extra resources through that. Ultimately, that changes your budget. So that you got to be careful for that. If you start fast tracking or crashing, you know, where you're just right. do extra, right? I mean, the, ultimately, those are the two major ways to get back on schedule. Yeah, those schedule compression techniques. And I like that PMI in the old curriculum, we talked a bit more on them, but they've retained those topics here. At the very end of scheduling, we're like, and by the way, you know, how often have people had time added to your project? Like no one ever in five and a half years has raised their hand, I think. Um, but everyone's had time taken away, you know, pandemics, <laughs> people, you know, uh, storms, unforeseeable things, of course. So fast tracking essentially is moving activities in parallel, which creates risk. So you, you do things simultaneous. This is like wanting to text and wanting to drive. <laughs> so you attempt to do both, hopefully not out there, but you do both and you're not good at either. All of a sudden there's, there's common sense ideas behind multitasking. Same would be true for a project. And then crashing you had mentioned where the way I phrase it is you just throw money at the problem to solve it. And that basically means your risk is still increased with the now additional risk of going over budget because now you're you're paying, like you said, to have double the people doing the work um, or paying people overtime. And there's always a price to that uh, monetarily. And if you pay people overtime to do extra work, they might be getting burned out. Like we're not we're not robots, right? So there's right. always a a give and take. But yeah. Wait, well done. I mean, I think that great definitions. Uh, I love the texting while driving, obviously, multitasking, um, increases risk, crashing, increases resource expenditure. Uh, so uh, great. I think I think we've got where we need to be on those two um, items, but schedule compression. Yeah, you might have to do it on to schedule variance. So yeah. schedule variance right? Where you're comparing the, the planned or the scheduled project, uh, progress of the project against actual results achieved, right? Yeah. So we've got our planned and then we've got, you know, what we've actually done and that will give us some schedule variance or SV if you ever see it on a, on the test. Talk to me a little bit about schedule variance. Yeah. So schedule variance is like one of the two, um, techniques we could say, or one of the tools to use within schedule control, which itself is one of the uh, basically outputs of earned value management in general, specifically earned value analysis. So it's it's pretty far nested in this bigger idea of EVM, which is how we generally present it in the class, earned value management. If you think of that, those words, we're trying to manage the value that's being earned currently versus the plan on our project. So SV in particular is a measure of schedule control um, that specifically revolves around, as you mentioned, uh, planned value and earned value. And plan value, how I phrase this, is the, the worth of the work that should be done at a certain amount of time. So it's the value of the work, which is an interesting idea to me if you if you dig into it. Um, now, earned value is, of course, the, the actual or the present value of the work you've done so far. And so I like to relate this idea because that itself can kind of confuse you and mm -hmm. usually does uh, in class. The idea of the difference of these, PV minus EV, is the formula for schedule variance. So it's the difference between your plan and the earned value of the work you're doing. It's like, okay, well, the value of the work we're doing, planned versus actual, you're saying the, the culminating result of that is a measure of time. 
And that's usually where people get mixed up. It's like, yeah, I get the value of work, but I think normally people go to monetary value. So enter in philosophical note of the one human resource none of us have enough of and all probably arguably want more of is time. And that's the difference between plan and earn value. So a real world example might be, and it's a loose example here, but if everyone cares about renovating bathrooms, that's what's popular out there like in the economy. There's a lot of value on renovated bathrooms. And so I say, I'm going to take a week and I'm going to spend $1,000 to renovate this bathroom. And analysis out there shows that I'll then be able to sell my home for $5,000 more. So this is a, the, the rudimentary idea of flipping a home. And if I, you know, life happens though. And so let's say I do the same work. So the same scope with the same money, I spend a thousand dollars, but life happens. And so instead of getting this work done in a week, it takes me eight months. And so let's say, well, what's the difference eight months from now, let's say no one cares about renovated bathrooms. They care about renovated kitchens. That's what's popular out there. So it wouldn't make sense intuitively that you've done the same work, you expended the same effort and money, but now you can only sell your home for, let's say, $2,000 more instead of five. And hopefully that example kind of highlights like, well, the value usually that we place on things is time. Um, so at the end of the day, I describe after that example that schedule variance is like measuring the efficiency because if you can get work done in a certain amount of time, there's value to that and expectation held. Well, if it goes above or below that, there's more value to it, but it's because of efficiency. It's because of time. Yeah. I like that. So, I mean, specifically, like said, one of the things that you did say, it, uh, like if you were mathematically looking at this as a formula, hmm. EV earned value minus PV would give you SV, which is schedule variance. So you first got to find that you know, planned value. You got to know what the what is that planned value, and then you put it you put it out there. It's that thousand dollars, right? Or really, in 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 reality terms, it would be five thousand because you're looking at the value of the completed right. potential, right? And then the planned value. Where are you today? Like, if you broke it down to, hey, I'm going to do the toilet, the sink, the bathtub, and the paint. We've got four items, right? If you've got two of them done halfway through the week, you know, you should be on schedule essentially right. because you've earned that potential value against what you've planned. So, which is a, like, that's, it's still a weird idea, right? If you, right. You, well, and that's why I remind usually try to head off questions that it's, it's the value of the work you're doing, which is usually valuable because of the time you're doing it in. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah, uh, if you budgeted a week, right? And let's just break it down to a, a week but that had Memorial Day, four items in four days, right? right. So you got four work days. And if you've got one item then per day to do, if it's day two and you've only got one, what would you, you might see an SV of less than one, right? So it would be, you know, a, a lower, be a 0. 0.5 versus a 1.0, which would be like on schedule. Right. So if we were, you know, uh, two items on done by the second day, it would be exactly 1.0. You're on schedule. Yeah. Well, now uh, schedule, schedule variance is usually zero for on, on. Okay. Uh, yeah. Good. Great schedule. point. Yeah. So this is the negative and positive one. So if you're, Good. If you're behind schedule, it'll be a SV will be negative. Negative. And okay. Especially on the exam, if they, if they phrase it that way, I mean, of course you could have decimals as well, but they'll usually frame it in terms of, negative or positive if it's you know above or below zero as like that neutral mark right um, so yeah if the difference between you know the value of what you've actually done include in the plan value so ev minus pv and it's negative one or something that's like saying hey you've you've been less efficient with your time than you had planned right uh, which is a, a weird way of looking at that because you may also be under budget and so you might think well hey that's that's good news but maybe you're under budget because you haven't done as much work as you should have according to today. Right. Uh, it's a really interesting look to me of, well, uh, analyzing, you know, the value of your project so far, um, all boiling down to a measure of efficiency is how I'd 
think of that. Okay. Uh, so zero is on schedule. Anything above zero is ahead of schedule. Anything below zero would be behind schedule. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So any positive numbers, basically good, good news for a schedule means you're um, ahead of schedule. Anything negative is bad news behind schedule. And so on the exam, you'd be looking for the answer choice that to some flavor, some degree is describing good news on your project. If it's a positive answer, bad news for the project schedule, yeah. uh, if it's negative. Great. Another way I like looking at that for those that are kind of fitness oriented is uh, power versus strength. And technically, like mathematically, like strength would be uh, mass times distance. And so it's moving a weight a certain distance. And so if you think of powerlifting competition, sometimes someone will deadlift an insane weight, but it takes them like a few seconds, um, sometimes 10 seconds or something. It's very dramatic. And But what's arguably uh, to some impressive is when someone can take that same weight and clean and jerk it or snatch it, meaning move the weight from the ground to all the way to overhead in a split second. You might say this is, this is not weightlifting. Who cares? Well, lifting some weight very slowly is a lot of strength, but lifting that same weight extremely fast takes a whole different set of kind of biological processes and mobility and whatever. So, and the only difference between those two is time. Um, so just another kind of reference to the efficiency note there of schedule variance, uh-huh. but it's a key, it's a key thing that we'll see on the exam. Um, it used to be implicit in the kind of PM community of instructors too, that there's, there was uh, less formulas, if not no formulas to calculate on this newer, uh, you know, 2021 and later exam, but now it's explicitly stated that there's, there's no calculations. So what we have to know are the rules that you and I just named. Um, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So yeah. Big vignette. They'll give you all the variables, EV, PV, and SV. They'll basically say, you know, the SV is two. I'll say, what does this mean for your project? And your answer choice, you know, it's positive. So you're looking for the one that's worded that you're ahead of schedule by, by whatever degree. So yeah, we perfect. have to know the, the rules of the formulas uh, and, and how they're applied. So, right. Yeah. Cause in modern project management, a lot of times you're, you're using some kind of project management information system that's going to calculate all this stuff for you. So you as a project manager need to be able to articulate what does a 2.0 on my SV mean? It means I'm way ahead of schedule. We're doing great. Now I got to go check my other parameters and make sure that I'm not just ahead of schedule because of, you know, we, we ramped up and launched three things, but now I got no resources. You know, there's a lot of other implications, but schedule variance helps you understand how well your project is progressing in terms of meeting the planned schedule. Right. Exactly. Oh, okay. And well, it's, it's, it's something that out in other discussions of EVM, um, it's what you said, comma, that can be plotted and graphed and very particularly, in, in my opinion, shown to stakeholders as uh, status reports. So it's really cool because the alternative is something like schedule variance is just answering someone's question of how's your project going when you say it's going, it's going well. It's going well. <laughs> right. You know, it gives you some kind of tangible marker in this case, PV and EV. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, it's an important point that you make is the elevator conversation. Stakeholder walks by, how's the project going? If you know your SB and some of the other EVM calculations, it's pretty easy for you to say, well, boss, we're looking at, we're ahead of schedule by this percentage. Maybe don't say SV is 2.0, right? They may, they may or may not know what that is, but turn it into a report, right? We take data, we turn uh, data into information, information into reports. That report could say we're X percentage of head of our planned schedule. Right. Uh, and that's a conversation you want to be ready to have in, in your schedule, your scope, your quality, your risk, your lessons learned, all the change log. Those are things that you just should know when you're walking through the halls of whatever work center you're a part of. Yeah. And I don't personally love this phrase. But I can see why it's a phrase in in life. Uh, time is money. Yes. And so I guess a, a parting note on on schedule variance and why it's important in say a status report is that you might say, "Hey, we're ahead of schedule by two weeks," and someone else might respond with, "Well, like so what?" 
And it's normally going to be responded to with, we're ahead of schedule, or sorry, reported as we're ahead of schedule by two weeks, which is $40,000 worth of work. And it's that worth of work part that is the value that we're talking about when we talk about planned and earned value. So usually that that rings a bit more with uh, some audiences that it's not just the time, it's the value of the work that's supposed to be done in that amount of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Mo most things are converted to money, especially yeah. when you're talking to executives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, talking about work, I mean, great. Another great segue is as we begin to uh, shift from the schedule, let's talk about the work breakdown structures or the WBS as uh, PMI would put it. And, you know, we, we know that it's a, it's a hierarchy uh, decomposition of the project into smaller, more manageable components, right? It organizes the project work into discrete like units uh, allowing for the easier planning, the execution, and then control of the project. So um, talk to me a little bit about WBS and you know what what are some of the unique things that we need to look for when we're building it? Yeah, so in the discussion of uh, scheduling in particular, uh, normally it, it'll it will have been built before we begin schedule planning. Um, and that's normally a caveat I give, which I've become, too philosophical about at points, but I, you have to plan out your scope in a project before you can plan anything else. Um, even in an adaptive environment where that scope is, uh, you know, a bit more opaque, a bit less, less clear, but the WBS is the key planning document. Um, it's called that in the curriculum. Um, and I would agree it's a visual representation of all the work to be completed on your project, uh, which is important because what also precedes the WBS as part of our scope baseline is the scope statement, which is usually a written document. And it's more often the case that written things don't get read <laughs> or comprehended as well. So it's like, we have this scope statement, we need to make it more digestible for everybody. So we create this WBS, this work breakdown structure. Um, decomposition is the technique that you hear on the exam. So I tell students, there's one tiny other caveat in estimating, but 99% of the time, if you're reading through a question on the exam and it mentions decomposition, you can immediately reference, okay, I'm, I'm for one, I'm probably planning, I'm probably conducting scope planning, and I'm probably building, creating the WBS. So it's a very quick narrowing. Um, and I like to think of eating an elephant. You can't just eat an elephant or rather, you know, how you eat it one bite at a time. And so the WBS is, well, hopefully not at all. That doesn't sound very appealing to me, but uh, you're breaking your work down into any kind of chunk that can then be managed and managed for us as we go on to continue other knowledge areas of planning as project managers will basically mean estimating the time and building schedule and doing what we just spoke of there, um, cost, resources, quality, um, quality measures and, and so on. So it's really important that we break the work down to the smallest degree. So yeah, basic great. components at the very top of the hierarchy, we have our project visually that's broken down into uh, deliverables. And these are more or less the largest chunks that once accepted will complete our project. So totally subjective, totally depends on your project and the topic, but if our project is to build a house, then maybe one of the, the deliverables is a pool and all of the landscaping and everything that goes with the pool. And maybe another deliverable is the garage um, and another deliverable is you know, the, the main home itself. So these very large chunks of work, deliverables are decomposed into uh, planning packages, which conceptually is just a group of work. So if we're building the pool and that's the deliverable we're focusing on, we know we're going to have like water stuff and we know we're going to have foundational stuff and then maybe uh landscaping stuff. And if that's all that we know about it, we would consider those chunks of work planning packages. Once we can start narrowing down some details, we call those planning packages work packages. And that might be what people see more referenced on the exam. So we have projects, they're decomposed into deliverables. Those are decomposed into 
planning or maybe more often seen as work packages. Finally, um, in some curriculums, you wait to decompose those work packages into activities. You wait until you're doing schedule planning because then you can analyze the critical path and do the things that we talked about in the beginning. But maybe more practically, while you're decomposing the WBS, you already have your audience in a conference room, let's say, and you're already, your mind's kind of fresh on it. You decompose those work packages to the activity level. That's the smallest level of the WBS. And you kind of know you've reached the backstop when you can describe an activity as a noun and a verb or vice versa, verb noun. So foundation, dug, or dig foundation of the house, let's say. So it's kind of a, the overview snapshot of the WBS. There's a lot of terms, um, a lot of uh, kind of caveats that are given in the curriculum as far as multiple work packages being controlled by control accounts, which are essentially pots of money in your organization that would be assigned to certain groups of work. Um, there's a code of accounts, and that's just how you decide with your team how you want to number or letter the organization of your WBS. So deliverable one, two, three, and maybe work package ABC. So if someone says, hey, you know, today we're going to talk about work package three alpha, everyone would have a very quick and charted reference that you're talking about whatever deliverable three is, work package, you know, A. So that's kind of the primary information, I think, of the WBS that one would need to know to be successful in most questions that they're going to see on that. Yeah, I like it. Uh, and well done. I mean, it's a lot there. So I'll just kind of kind of back it up just a little bit just to just to expand it. And so you can hear it maybe again. But Garrick was talking about, you know, as you begin to decompose, right, immediately, that's a buzzword to cage you into knowing that, hey, we're probably predictive, we're probably planning, and we're probably talking about a WBS. All right. So that was point point one. Yeah. Uh, as you begin to decompose things, you you keep breaking them down. And I like the pool analogy, right? The big at the very top of the pyramid would be, hey, deliver this customer a pool, right? So it would just say pool, right? A noun. It'd be a big deliverable of noun. And then it would maybe break it down into, uh, you know, the the concrete work, right? The the water uh, piping work, sure. uh, the mechanical pumps, you know, all these other things. And it just break, you're just breaking them down. And then um, you keep going down further until you get down to that verb state, which then really is an activity or it could be a part of your schedule activity list. But the smallest unit on a WBS would be like the work package. And then that could be assigned to a team member. I think you could say, all right, out of the concrete work, we're going to have to dig the hole, right? You're in charge of digging the hole, right? That is, that's your work package. Uh, you're in charge of, you know, laying the rebar. Uh, you're in charge of spraying the gunite, you know? So then each one of those work packages, and then you talked about um, using those so that you can build your estimates on, and then you can overlay them into a schedule. So that was, that was great. So you want to make sure you, Overlay how long it'll take, what it's going to cost, what resources are needed, and that could be part of your WBS. Maybe it's in the dictionary on the backside or whatever. Right. Um, yeah. Communication. I love that. That's probably the prime benefit a project manager gets from it is the communication and coordination. We're going to talk about work package 3B. Got it. Everybody immediately can flip their page. Oh, 3B, 3B. Oh, man, that's got my name on it. <laughs> right. Okay. Let's talk about 3B. Where are we at on that? All right, great. So uh, well done, well said. I think that was uh, pretty comprehensive. Anything else come to mind uh, as I was, you know, going through? Yeah, I think the I uh, my army brain kicks in of task delegation, and especially on a predictive environment, it's it's again why I think it'd be considered a key planning document is exactly what you said is that represents visually a delegation of work. That when we go, when when we as a PM and our team go to plan all these other knowledge areas of uh, aspects of our project, quality, cost, resource, all that, 
it's this WBS that you can easily refer back to to estimate what you need and why and who's going to do the work at the activity or work package level, whatever's appropriate for your project. Um, and it's similar to what we see in other projects that are adaptive, where you start uh, managing and, and tracking the progress of work in groups because that work has functionality together. It intuitively pairs together. That's the idea behind you know these deliverables and work packages and so it's a really good way to bring some order to what would otherwise be, you know, a lot of chaos on on what it is to do. All all nested, by the way, in scope planning. So it's all within this wheelhouse of just determining what it is we are here to do. So very important for a project. Yeah, I like that. And then talk about like flexibility and adaptability is can a WBS change? Yeah, it can change. If you're on a predicted project, you just use a change control system to change it. If you're on a adaptive, you know, you might call it your backlog, right? right? So it could be a completely different word. You may not use the word WBS. And I think another buzzword here is like, okay, if you hear backlog, we're talking about adaptive. Uh, if you hear disaggregation, that's probably adaptive, you know? So, I mean, there's some couple buzzwords in there. So decomp, WBS, predictive, disaggregation, and backlog, adaptive. Yeah. And, and you'd mentioned the... Uh... The change where a WBS, if you if you you know follow along visually and kind of uh, thought of doing all this with a project team, that is a lot. That's a lot of time. That's a lot of detail on a product. And for those of us who have had to, you know, trudge our way through the swamps of fitting tiny little things on the PowerPoint slides, it's a lot of work to create this product. So it makes sense that in a predictive environment, it can change, <laughs> but that change needs to be really regimented, really constrained, really controlled, really analyzed if it's necessary. Um, because if nothing else, that WBS is going to take a lot to uh, change and deconflict and coordinate. So it speaks to that predictive environment. Whereas the backlog, it's kind of naturally built to change. It's, it's easily, you know, added to and taken away from. So Nice. Yeah. I like that. And a hundred percent of the work is defined on the WBS. So right. if you're going to do a pool, it better have everything down to the last, you know, the chlorine tablets that you place on top of the, uh, the, the yeah. box that you hand the owner. Right. And then they yeah. say, Hey, listen, this is your first chunk of chlorine tablets. And that better be identified too. It's like delivery, you know, during the delivery, we're going to provide the first month service. Bang, that, that, yeah. even that should be, you know, so. Yeah. And, and that brings up another good point of the WBS. Obviously, this is like a, the rock star document of any project here, but it should include the project and the product work. Um, if the project is to say build a home where you need to have elements of that WBS that account for your administrative project work as well, you know, yeah. secure conference room, uh, you know, pick coffee to serve in the break room, whatever it might be. But um, the, well, I lost my train of thought there, but, oh, the 100% rule, it's to make sure that you account for all of the work for your project, which, which might sound common sense, like, well, yeah, duh. Well, creating a house with no roof, let's say that's a 95% instead of a 100%, like that's going to be obvious. People usually notice when not enough of the work is done on something. So what I uh, explained the WBS is really helping to solidify for a project team is to avoid or prevent scope creep and gold plating. And those terms you might see on the exam that both refer to doing too much. It's doing beyond what the scope was. Um, scope creep is essentially when those good idea fairies and the additional work come from outside your project team. So maybe stakeholders, a sponsor, the customer, Gold plating, still doing too much beyond what was planned, but it comes from either us, the PM, or or our project team. Uh, some of our team members getting froggy and adding work on there. So specifying the WBS according to the 100% rule is really important for almost a counterintuitive way to make sure we don't do too much because that is possible. And we're not, see we're not uh, seeking to exceed customer expectations. We're seeking to exactly meet them, which is much harder to do. So we have to be very specific on what our scope is spelled yeah. out on that WBS. 
Yeah, great, great example. 100% um, to protect both expansion and, you know, doing too little, right? Uh, yeah. So, so it's also not the 105% rule. Right. Or, yeah. <laughs> I like that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not plus or minus. It's it's right on 100. You know, don't add the extra palm tree because you think oh, that that would be really nice. That'd be a really nice touch, right? So Yeah, I referenced one of the old... Um, I don't know if it's even a show still, but uh, one of the the fixer upper type shows um, that was popular and they would build just for example, hypothetically a custom dog house, you know, for the family's dog that rep that replicates the home they just built or whatever. And it's like, that's, that's all well and good, but technically, technically that time, the money, and if no other resource, the human energy that went into building that could have went into building the scope, the house a little faster, or maybe do a slightly higher quality standard, or you can get creative in that, but it's like, technically we don't want to exceed standard because it means that we could have done our original scope better or faster or cheaper or whatever it means. So right. Somebody's paying for it. Right. Yeah. Either in time, quality or resources or money or whatever sure. else. Yeah. 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 Great point. Yeah. I know we, we didn't plan for this, but um, it seems like a great time to talk about it is explaining work packages. I know we did a lot already. It's the smallest unit of work within a project. Yeah. N not to include, I mean, obviously activities are even smaller, but they're, but they're not on the WBS typically like they're on your activity list, which is part of your schedule. Um, they're discrete. So work packages are discrete tasks or activities that can be assigned, scheduled or tracked individually. Um, think about like the definition of a work package. It's deliverable oriented, uh, that can represent, like, like you said, mostly we did talk about specific tasks to be completed. Um, it captures manageable units of work. So like maybe it's, we're going to do everything in an eight hour period or a one day period or, you know, and you can figure this out or you just plan that, hey, this is going to be 12 hour chunks because we work 12 hour shifts around here. Right. So however you do it, right? Um, characteristics, see several key ones, they're well-defined. Yep. Everybody's got to have a central understanding of them. If it doesn't have that clear scope, objective or deliverable associated with it, you kind of remove the benefit of communication and clarity, right? Right. Uh, it better be hierarchy in structure. So it's got to fall somewhere within that um, structure, the WBS, whether it's, you know, closer to the top, closer down to the bottom where you're actually assigning it. They should be time bound, which specific start and end dates that you can overlay onto your schedule, which should uh, also help with, uh, with your schedule planning. And then assignment responsibility, right? You better assign somebody responsible for that. And it can be yourself, but hopefully it's a team member. Yep. Dep dependencies, it's got to have some kind of, a, you know, they have dependencies on other work projects or other activities. Um, and then estimation and control, they should have specific estimating effort, duration, resources, and and then show your work, right? And you got you got a basis of estimates. How did you come by that estimate? You know, so there's a lot of different things that you want to put in there and then reporting and evaluation kind of not to get too adaptive with it. What's the definition of done? How do we know when we're complete? Right. Yep. So that's another really great one. Smallest units of work on a project represented by discrete tasks or activities. Like if you were just going to define it, what did I, what did I miss? Anything? The, the only it's again, it's more questions I usually get in class right at this point, because even some of the curriculum will will show one thing say the other and then you go you know you you go research it online and it gets even more muddied um how i phrase it is the work package is probably the lowest level of the wbs that we are going to care about as project managers because we're dealing with you know the whole sphere outside of our project plus all the work getting taken care of you know plus uh emotional intelligence, social skills, leadership skills type stuff going on. There's a lot. So we're not going to dive into the weeds of the activities. Normally, that's the job of our subject matter experts and the hired people doing the work. Um, so that's usually because people say, well, active are activities a part of this WBS or not? It's like, well, 
No, because that's not, I'm not going to track that probably as a, as a PM, I shouldn't be. Um, but it's what our SMEs and whoever are going to be estimating as far as how much time it's going to take and resource and cost. It's all at that, you know, activity level. When we aggregate that up, that's what we're tracking. And like you said, holding people accountable, it's how I'm like managing the project. If I manage the project down to the activity level, I'm probably micromanaging mm. to a significant <laughs> degree. Um, yeah. But as far as requirements, it just brought to mind, I was going to mention the uh, the RTM, the requirements traceability matrix, as well as the uh, RACI chart, responsible, accountable, consulted, informed. Um, that will tie into this WBS. That'll help us define acceptance criteria, which in an adaptive project feeds the definition of done. So it's just another way of saying that the WBS is a, a magnificent tool to make sure that we're meeting acceptance criteria in a macro sense, um, tying back to who kind of cares more, you know, about that work and who's assigned to do it. If you have a bunch of work and it's all abiding by the hundred percent rule, and there's any portion of that that doesn't have someone's name on it, it is not a good assumption that that work will get done. Yeah. So, yeah. Assume nothing. <laughs> oh yeah. I like that. Yeah. Well, great. I mean, so now what we've covered is the critical path, which I think great examples, you know, with the dominoes, you know, and, and some of the other uh, stuff, as far as it's the longest path to completion, uh, they're the critical activities, there's zero float. Um, we talked about scheduling variance or schedule variance SV, right? Like EV minus PV. So earn value uh, minus your planned value right. gives you your schedule value. Zero being on track, less than zero behind schedule more than zero ahead of schedule. And then we talked about WBSs where, you know, it's your higher graphical pictorial of your project where we decompose everything on the project, everything that needs to be done in a noun sense. And then it's the smallest level is down to the work package. And then we finished it up with the work packages, just talking about what they do, assigning responsibility, dependencies, estimation, reporting and evaluation, uh, it's the discrete activities and tasks that will be done on the project, and it'll help facilitate the effective project planning, resource allocation, monitoring and control. And like you said, you know, uh, the accountability for who is on the hook to get that done. So yeah. well done. That was a lot. Obviously, we covered four major, major areas of the uh, of the content outline, but I think you know, sliding the work package in when we're talking about the WBS just seems natural. Was yeah. to get that part done as well, but well done. Anything before we part? No, I think that was a pretty good chunk uh, for whoever whoever's listening, and you know, hope hope that that helps clarify some of these ideas. That that of course we only have so much time to go over in classes, and that um, there's information overload out there on. So hopefully, it's helped to clarify some stuff specific to the uh, exam. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the PM Pathfinder series and want to join the profession, certify, or maintain your PDUs by visiting vets2pm.com and looking up Project Manager Essential Toolbox or a bootcamp.